So, you probably know about this cartoon called The Powerpuff Girls. It was an awesome cartoon that ran on Cartoon Network quite some time ago, and for many fans has stood the test of time years and years after its initial broadcast run. Well, what if we took that and made it anime? Well, it is my pleasure to introduce you to Powerpuff Girls Z, an anime adaptation of the original Powerpuff Girls cartoon, parodying its name off of the famous Dragon Ball Z by just adding a Z at the end of the name. Yeah, that's right, this is actually a thing, and when I say adaptation, I mean adaptation. This is a complete retelling, with the reintroduction of key characters, such as the Rowdy Rough Boys. In this series, our main trio are more magical girls than they are superheroes, each even coming with their own magical girl transformation sequence in the vein of, say, Sailor Moon. The anime has a 52 episode run, so if you're a fan of magical girl anime, why not check it out? Maybe some more awesome western cartoons will end up getting the anime treatment sometime soon. The original Yu-Gi-Oh! as well as all the seasons after it were all about a little game called Duel Monsters. And for many, that's the main draw of the show. An anime all about a real world card game in a fictional world all about said card game. But what if I told you that there's a season of the show dubbed Season Zero by fans that isn't about Duel Monsters at all? Yu-Gi-Oh! Season Zero is an often forgotten season of the anime due to the fact that it never got an official release here in the West, and is often considered as its own version of the show. Yu-Gi-Oh! Season Zero is a more direct adaptation of the events that transpire in the original Yu-Gi-Oh! manga. This series features a huge shift in tone, and even animation from the show that you may know, and focuses on a young Yugi Moto dealing with high school drama, friends, and the murderous Egyptian soul trapped within his millennium puzzle, Yami. Due to the fact that this series has no duel monsters for the most part, Yami challenges all of his foes to simple betting games, with the loser forfeiting his soul. This can often lead to some pretty awesome mental battles that challenge the likes of Death Note and JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. Also, Kaiba has green hair. That's a thing. Here's a little compilation of white lies to help you get your non-anime watching friends into anime. The Promised Neverland is a cute little show about orphan children who get adopted by a kind, caring woman with zero ulterior motives at all. Boku no Hero Academia is about a young boy named Deku who lives in the world of superheroes despite not having his own powers. But he wants to be a hero anyway, going for a more Batman type of approach. Death Note is a high school drama about a young boy named Light who is constantly being outdone by his best friend L. Now I know that the title has death in it, but nobody dies in this series. Just a bunch of wholehearted fun. Oh, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is great. It's this period drama about two feuding stepbrothers in 1800s Britain. Yeah, no, that's really it. There's really nothing bizarre about it. I don't know why they put that in the title. Higurashi, When They Cry, is a slice of life comedy anime about a young boy and a group of cute girls he hangs out with. And nothing bad ever happens. So consider this, if All Might is the Superman of My Hero Academia, then who would be the Batman? Well, that title would go to the lesser known hero, Knuckle Duster, of My Hero spin-off manga, My Hero Academia Vigilantes. Vigilantes follows a small group of, you guessed it, vigilante heroes, who are explained to be heroes that haven't officially been registered as such, and really don't care. Our main character of this series is a remarkably similar character to Izuku Midoriya, both having righteous hearts of justice. This guy, however, is not the chosen one who is given All Might's power. This is Koichi Haimawari, otherwise known as the Crawler. Deku may have one of the greatest quirks of all time, but Koichi's quirk is quite the opposite, which is simply the ability to slide around or stick onto any surface and go at the speed of no higher than a bicycle. However, that doesn't hold him back, as with his vigilante friends Pop Step and THE Knuckle Duster, Koichi takes down villains that the pro heroes just don't have the urgency to involve themselves with, showing that it's not the power that makes the hero. The manga is currently ongoing and now is probably the best time to start it up and give it a read. The Promised Neverland is an anime about children dying. Well, it's not only about that, I guess. It's also a psychological thriller about orphan children and their escape from a farm they were raised on in order to become food for demonic beings. Today, I wanted to talk about this show because not only do I like it a lot, but there's a very specific scene and dialogue that I want to talk about a little bit. In the show, the character Ray has a dramatic reveal that he has the ability to remember everything throughout his life, all the way back to 
when he was a fetus. And this moment in the anime really kind of messed with me for a second. I started to think about if this was actually even possible, or if it was just some made-up anime plot device just for the sake of it. So after doing a little bit of research, turns out stuff like this has actually been observed to happen in some real-world people. Normally, people have this thing called infantile amnesia, which causes you to not remember things when you were a baby. And this is brought up in the actual show. But some people actually don't have this at all, and can recall specific instances from when they were extremely young, even all the way back to when they were a one-year-old. Although it hasn't been entirely proven that it's possible to remember things as a fetus, that's still a little tiny bit crazy. So Ray, I, I really doubt that that you can do that. I, I doubt that this is a thing you can do. Once again, we have to thank science for ruining the realism in any sort of anime. You may know everything there is to know about Dragon Ball, but do you know of Yamcha's lesser known spinoff? Entitled That Time I Got Reincarnated as Yamcha, it follows the story of a young Dragon Ball fan who tragically dies and gets reincarnated into the Dragon Ball universe. Sadly though, as the title may have made you aware, the body that this fan is given control of is the incredibly weak Yamcha. However, using the power of his in-depth Dragon Ball knowledge, Yamcha ends up becoming one of the strongest characters in the entire series, even ending up with a near victory against the Prince of All Saiyans, Vegeta. The three chapter series is a fairly quick read, but but an excellent choice for Dragon Ball lovers, featuring a unique what-if scenario and brand new fights that are sure to knock any fan's socks off. Akira Toriyama, the creator of the popular Dragon Ball and Dr. Slump series, has a lot of cool and interesting facts surrounding him. But today, we're going to take a look at a completely useless fact about him. Toriyama has always liked to create self-inserts of himself to draw in his various manga, the most popular among them being a robotic version of himself called Toribot. But did you know that before Toribot, he drew himself as a bird? Weird choice, right? Well, not so weird when you realize that the Tori in Toriyama actually means bird in Japanese. Pretty useless knowledge, but eh, still interesting, I guess. Odds are, if you've watched Dragon Ball Super, then you're familiar with this guy right here, Jacko, the Galactic Patrolman. But did you also know that he has his own manga illustrated by Akira Toriyama that takes place in the Dragon Ball universe? Entitled Jacko, the Galactic Patrolman, it follows Jacko as he finds himself stranded on planet Earth, with no way of getting back in contact with the space police known as the Galactic Patrol. There, he meets Omori, a secluded old man, and Tights, Bulma's sister from the main Dragon Ball series. The manga is a lot more dialogue focused and leans more towards the original Dragon Ball's form of storytelling, with a heavy portion of comedy and a little bit of action sprinkled throughout. It's actually a really good read, so I'd highly suggest checking it out if you're interested, as it's only a simple one volume long. It's pretty short, you can just dip in and dip out. I'm really hoping that this has a chance to become an animated OVA in the future, given how unique of a look into the DB universe it is. Top 5 anime characters I would like to punch in the face, if they were real. Yeah, no, seriously, we're doing this right now. Number 5, Seto Kaiba. Starting off, we have a rich, spoiled brat who has such a vendetta against his peers that he started an entire citywide tournament just to win and show them up. Kaiba is just sort of a tool. A cool tool, but still a giant tool. The reason he's not lower on the list is because at least he gets a sort of redemption arc at some point. And like I said, he can be kinda cool sometimes. Just, just kinda. 4. Mello. Mello is just sort of an entitled brat. Sure, he's trying to be a hero and save people's lives, but he's only doing it to prove people that he's the smartest. And in doing so, he messes up other people's plans and ends up getting in the way a couple of times. Number 3, Dio. Dio is a jerk. There's just no way around this. Even if you eliminate the whole being an immortal vampire who wants to take over the world thing, he's just still a massive jerk. I mean, the first thing this man does when he's introduced to the plot is kick a dog in the face. And anybody who hurts animals is pretty much defined as the worst in my book. Number 2, the guy who is the main character of Black Clover. Yeah, I don't watch this show, and this guy is pretty much the one reason why. Never mind that the fact that the setup of the show has been kind of done to death. I just, I just hate this guy. He will not stop screaming. And yeah, I know what you're gonna say, and no, I don't even care to Google what this guy's name is. I think it's like Anthony or Aster. Yeah, yeah, let's just say Ast- I think it's Aster. One, Mineta from My Hero Academia. Okay, so I know that this is an easy choice, but, but come on, he ticks all of the possible boxes. He's a huge pervert, check. Adds literally nothing to the plot, check. Leeches off other characters' effort, check. Extremely creepy, check. 
Resembles a small gremlin. Check. Congrats, Mineta. Congrats on being the most punchable anime character in my book ever. JoJo's Bizarre Adventures plot has gotten a bit complicated over the series run, so I'm here to break it all down. Welcome to JoJo Summarized, Part 1, Phantom Blood. 1800s England. A young Jonathan Joestar meets his newly adopted brother, Dio Brando. You see, Jonathan's father, George, made a promise to Dio's parents, claiming that if they both died, Dio would be taken care of by the Joestar family. However, what wasn't known to the Joestars is how big of a jerk Dio actually is, as he makes his grand entrance to the Joestar estate by kicking Jonathan's dog in the face. If you can't tell by now, Dio's a pretty bad guy and is only around to steal the Joestar fortune. Fast forward a couple of years and Dio seems to have mellowed out a little bit and gotten nice with everyone, no doubt realizing that he's probably been a huge jerk in the past. Nah, just kidding, it was all a ruse! Dio ends up killing Jonathan's dad and becomes a vampire with the help of a magical stone mask. Oh, did I mention that? He has a magical stone vampire mask. Jonathan, with the help of his newfound friends, William Zeppeli and everyone's favorite boy, Speedwagon, end up chopping Dio Dio's head off with magical sun karate, which is also a thing. After presumably killing Dio, Jonathan goes on a celebratory honeymoon cruise with his newly wed wife, Arena Pendleton. Sadly though, turns out Dio wasn't dead and kills Jonathan along with everyone else on the boat, except for Arena and some unnamed baby. Though Jonathan lay defeated, he can rest easy knowing that Dio will probably never show up ever again. Probably. Maybe. Hey, I like fun facts, and I like JoJo. Let's talk about a nice little JoJo fun fact you might not have known. The creator of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Hirohiko Araki, has taken a lot of inspiration from his favorite music when naming characters and abilities in JoJo. Some noteworthy examples from Part 1 include the character Speedwagon being named after the band Ario Speedwagon, and William A. Zeppeli being named after Led Zeppelin. But have you ever wondered how Jonathan Joestar got his name? The original JoJo that started it all. Well, in in contrast to other naming schemes throughout part 1 and onward, Jonathan's name isn't actually a reference to any music or band. It's actually a reference to a restaurant that Araki and his editor would meet at by the name of Jonathan's. Yeah, that's right, a restaurant named Jonathan's is where Jonathan got his name. But what about the name Joestar? Where did this come from? Well, Joestar actually came about because of Jonathan's first name. It came from Araki liking names that were simply alliterations. You see, Jonathan's first name starts with a J. And here Hiko Rocky actually admitted that he came up with the name Joestar because he wanted a name that would have the same first letter as the first name. Jonathan Joestar. It just sounds good to say. Okay, so we all know that JoJo has these crazy unique abilities called stands throughout its long series run. So here's a look at a stand that I don't see a lot of people talking about. Oh, and light spoilers for part six of JoJo. The stand I want to talk about is this stand called Planet Waves. Planet Waves is a stand from Part 6, Stone Ocean, that doesn't seem to be brought up that much amongst fans, despite it having a relatively cool fight in the manga. It's this humanoid looking stand, so you would think that it would be a punch ghost much like other stands in the series, but that isn't the case. Its main ability is actually to draw meteorites from the sky towards its user, which collide with anyone near them, causing massive damage. In the event that they actually fall into the user though, they will simply disintegrate before coming in contact. In the manga, this stand is used in conjunction with another stand called Survivor. Survivor causes all the people near it to become extremely aggressive and powerful. This causes for the fight against Planet Waves' user to be very up close and personal, with the main Jojo, Jolene, often forgetting that she even has a stand to use, and having her rely solely on her fisticuffs. Also, you know, since Planet Waves does that, meteorites. A lot of meteorites and fists. Rohan Kishibe of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure is a jerk, but he's our jerk. While at first he was disliked by fans due to his blatant insanity, I think I speak for everyone when I say that as of now, I can't help but love this narcissistic manga artist. And hey, the creator of JoJo, Hirohiko Araki, must feel the same exact way, because Rohan actually has his own spin-off series named The Spoke Kishibe Rohan. This series is just as bizarre as you may expect, but focuses less on stand battles and is more of an anthology series on strange paranormal encounters. Think of The Twilight Zone, featuring Rohan. 
Currently, the series has been adapted into two OVAs, included with the Japanese Blu-ray releases of Diamond is Unbreakable. And we aren't sure when we'll be getting them officially in the West, but whenever that happens, I highly suggest giving it a watch. This series is insanely unique in both art style and direction from the original JoJo series, and it could even function as its own thing beyond JoJo. Another reason to love Rohan Kishibe. Okay, so if you're a JoJo fan, you might not know this, but Rohan has a Gucci bag, and the Gucci bag has a stand, and I'm gonna talk about it right now. Okay, so in a JoJo's Bizarre Adventure one-shot, uh, the creator Hirohiko Araki wrote a sort of pseudo-advertisement for Gucci, this company that makes really expensive clothing and accessories. In this one-shot, we get to know a little bit about this Gucci bag that Rohan owns, and believes to be cursed. However, he finds out that the Gucci bag isn't cursed, it just has a stand. Yes. This inanimate object has a stand. The stand isn't given a name, but its ability is equivalent exchange. Okay, so basically, if you put any expensive material in the bag, it magically vanishes, but it ends up finding its way back to you. So, for example, if you put money in the bag, that might cause a nearby hotel to allow you to stay the night for free. But in reality, it's just due to the equivalent exchange of the money that you put in the bag. So, here's a question, if I may pose this. Why would you use this stand at all? Why not just take the money and do anything you want with it? Why would you put the money in the bag, let it vanish, and then just come back to you in some weird way? Why would you ever let this magical bag decide what you should purchase? This thing is actually worthless. Okay, so this has been racking my brain for a while. Why do I, and many people like me, love Dio from JoJo's Bizarre Adventure so much? I mean, when you think about it, he's kind of just a huge scumbag. So why is he so enjoyable to watch? And that's when it hit me. It's not because he's a scumbag that we like him. It's because he's the ultimate scumbag. Dio is the only person who would ever do the horrible things that he does. He's so comically evil that it's it's hard not to love the guy. The first thing of significance he ever does is kick a dog in the face. Just to solidify that he's the main villain. He's the only guy that would straight up methodically ruin his stepbrother's life just because he can. And no one else who had the ability to stop time would use it to screw with the guy and move him down a couple of steps on a staircase just to mess with him. Sure, you can like people like Seto Kaiba for their jerkiness, but Dio is on a whole whole nother level, man. So thanks, Dio. Thanks for being the most lovable scumbag I know. Giorno Giovanna's stand, Golden Experience, is extremely overpowered. There's just no arguing this at all. In fact, it's probably the most powerful stand ever in the entirety of JoJo. But what makes it so powerful, you might ask? Well, first we got the basics. He can punch really, really fast and really, really hard. Second, we've got its life-giving ability. Essentially, Golden Experience can give life to any inanimate object, making it an animal or a bug or whatever. And this ability doesn't seem to have any clear limits. And not only that, but all living objects created from Golden Experience's abilities actually go back to wherever or whomever they came from, meaning that this ability can also function as a tracking device. Third, Golden Experience has the ability to learn, as shown during the Babyface arc, where Giorno straight up heals himself from a near-death experience mid-fight, which then leads us to its fourth ability, being able to heal its user and pretty much anyone by creating organic material. And fifth, don't even get me started on Golden Experience Rec- <laughs> And that's why Giorno Giovanna stand Golden Experience is like the most OP thing ever. Whether you're a new or veteran fan of the JoJo's Bizarre Adventure series, you may not have heard of one of its more unique spin-offs, named Dead Man's Questions. Dead Man's Questions follows a rebellious ghost bounty hunter, who you may find a bit familiar from one of the previous story arcs. Sadly though, our spiritual main character seems to have complete amnesia, and is blissfully unaware of who exactly he was in a previous life. That's all good though, because now he works for a monk that's able to speak with the dead. This monk gives him payment in exchange for dealing out some other otherworldly punishments to some unsuspecting ghosts and hauntings. And of course, just like JoJo's, the life of a spiritual enforcer does lead to some pretty wacky scenarios. The full spinoff is a total of three chapters and is a pretty quick read. A definite recommendation for fans who are curious as to what else the weird world of JoJo has in store for them outside of the main series. 
I'm a pretty big anime fan, but that wasn't always the case. I used to sort of dislike anime when I was a kid, but that all changed when I sat down and really watched my very first anime, Kanichi the Mightiest Disciple. As an introduction to the genre, this show was so cool to me. It was all about this kid named Kanichi who wanted to become the strongest fighter in an effort to stand up for himself. And as a kid who was bullied a lot in school, I was all about this mindset. Being able to be cool and stand Stand up for yourself. The idea of becoming this strong, legendary fighter was so freaking cool, and the show did not disappoint. Throughout the story, Kenichi trained with a group of martial art masters who had all perfected different, specific fighting styles, making Kenichi proficient in all of them, and leading to a couple of awesome fights. Looking back, Kenichi is just sort of an okay show now, but at the time, as my sort of gateway to anime, it was an awesome peek at what lied beyond for me. So yeah. Thanks, Kenichi. You done good, buddy. Okay, so fear plays a pretty big role in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. If you watched any of the episodes or read the manga, you'll know what I'm talking about. A lot of situations can be pretty creepy at times, and that's because series creator Hirohiko Araki really loves horror. But that begs the question, what does Araki himself find so terrifying about real life? Well, here's his very own top 10 list, taken from a direct quote. Number 10, Death. Number 9, those creatures that can hang onto your ceiling, like cockroaches and etc. 8, imagination. 7, people you know. 6, you have bad luck as the result of fate telling. 5, a hospital. 4, destroying natural environment. 3, a closed room. 2, strangers. And the number one thing that shines through is darkness. Araki's one true fear is darkness. The creator of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Hirohiko Araki, is a sort of strange dude. I mean, when you end up being the creator of a series like JoJo's, you'd have to be at least a little bit weird, I guess. Before each volume of the JoJo manga, Araki likes to leave a personal quote from himself to the reader. Some manga artists do something similar to this to give a glimpse into their personal lives. Araki does this because... Well, I'm not exactly sure why, because his, his quotes are insane. So welcome to Araki's Quote Corner, a little series showing you a tiny piece of the insanity that is the mind of Hirohiko Araki. Today's quote comes from volume 50 of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. I must be the only one who cares, but I often nearly drown myself. Not in the sea or in a river, no. I narrowly escape death drinking a glass of water. I only need a mouthful of water to suffocate, and I find myself unable to breathe. Generally, if I stay calm, I manage to get my breath back little by little. But recently, I almost passed out. That was a close one. That day, I miraculously escaped death. To everyone's indifference. Hello and welcome to Araki's Quote Corner, a disturbing look into the insane life of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure creator, Hirohiko Araki. The following quote and story is 100% real. I couldn't make this up even if I tried. <clears throat> I have a younger sister, in her 50s, and apparently she fell and broke her leg. Was it minor? Was she severely hurt? I had no idea. And then my sister said she wouldn't be attending an Araki family celebration. So I called her and asked, is your leg okay? And my sister responded, Ufu. Just that. What in the world? Why couldn't she give me an answer? This sister has a daughter in her 20s, so I asked her, How is your mom's leg doing? And she responded, Ufu. Just that. Are they telling me to use my imagination to discern the hidden meaning behind Ufu? What is Ufu? Hello and welcome back to Araki's Quote Corner, a disturbing look into the insane life of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure creator, Hirohiko Araki. The following quote is from the original Stardust Crusaders manga run, and is pretty terrifying overall. When I'm traveling, I can feel very lonely, so I appreciate the kindness of strangers from the bottom of my heart. Still, sometimes I start wondering why someone is being so nice to me. Are they actually evil and planning my demise? Who's my friend? Who's my enemy? A big smiling face says, please give me all your money. Ah! Now that's scary. 
Hello, and welcome back to A Rocky's Quote Corner, a disturbing look into the insane life of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure creator, Hirohiko Araki. The following quote comes to us from the beginning of Stardust Crusaders, and I have never heard Araki so angry in any of these quotes before. My friends often tell me, you're really rude when I call you when you're working. I stopped and thought about it when my mother called me and said, you're so rude, you're no son of mine. But think about it, people. I don't see what's so hard to understand. When I'm working, I can't blab about stupid stuff on the phone for hours like I do when I'm just hanging out, or I'll be late submitting my work. I'm a Gemini, so I have a split personality. Hello, and welcome back to Araki's Quote Corner, a disturbing look into the insane life of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure creator, Hirohiko Araki. Honestly, I thought I'd run out of quotes after a couple of these, but th they still keep coming. Today's quote is all about sleep, and how Araki is pretty much an inhumanly powerful person. It seems that genetic code determines how much time a person needs to sleep, but recently, a strange event happened. Until six months before, I didn't have a clear mind without my eight hours of sleep. But lately, I've noticed that three or four hours were enough, and that I didn't want to sleep for eight hours anymore, even though I knew it was bad for my health. What caused this transformation? My change of diet? My pillow? This is a complete mystery. Hello and welcome back to Araki's Quote Corner, a disturbing look into the insane life of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure creator, Hirohiko Araki, and we are still going strong with this being the sixth installment. And speaking of six, today's quote is from Part 6, Stone Ocean, and involves Araki believing himself to have superpowers. The other day, I bought five CDs. The musical genre went from jazz to rock and R&B, all from different artists. However, when I read the text on the albums, I noticed that the producer was always the same. A guy named Antonio Larraid. What were the chances that I took these five CDs? It made me think about the same kind of miracle which would result in a royal straight flush at poker or winning the lottery. A divine revelation, you could say. Hello and welcome to Araki's Quote Corner, a disturbing look into the insane life of JoJo's bizarre adventure creator, Hirohiko Araki. Today's quote may shine some light on why Araki seemingly never references a lot of previous events throughout the JoJo series. Many fans have coined the phrase, Araki forgot, but in all seriousness, he really did. It's nothing to brag about, but I'm horrible at remembering things. I can barely remember what I did for fun as a kid, or what such TV show was about. The other day, I saw Rai Maezawa, a Japanese actress, but I completely forgot her name. When I asked someone what her name was, they laughed at me. I should mention that I'm a huge Rai Maezawa fan. I'm really worried about my future.